presentation of the day in both of the conference. Oh, <laughs> not a problem, sorry. So our last presentation of the day and of the conference is James McMahon. And he, the title of his presentation is The Spectre of Radical Creation, Capitalist Power, and Qualities of Sabotage. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess first things first is uh, thank you very much for those that are at the uh, last uh, panel of the conference. And thank you very much for everyone that's attended as kind of on behalf of the organizing committee. Uh, we're, I guess we, you know, we really feel that all the hard work has paid off. I think it's run relatively smoothly and all the presentations have been great. So uh, thank you to everybody. So uh, today uh, I'm going to kind of in the spirit of the kind of a workshop format, I'm going to kind of, uh, kind of associate with my friend Barton Fink over here and uh, kind of say that I seem to, ha I'm having difficulties or doing my best to understand the nature of the Hollywood film business. So what I'm going to do today is kind of go through just one aspect of my project. Uh, there'll be some parts that I will not cover. Uh, and uh, there's also something on the handout here that will kind of give you an indication of maybe some larger things that I'm thinking about. So when I did this presentation, uh, sorry, I think, I believe the handouts, there's some more over there. Uh, no, oh, that's um, So kind of going into this presentation, I wanted to use these two quotations from Capitalist Power as kind of a lead off. Uh, into this presentation, so I'm just going to quickly read them. Capitalization discounts the power of capitalists to strategically limit social creativity and well-being. The second one, capitalists constantly try to force life into a box, to harness creativity, to convert quality into quantity. This is the nature of their power, but they can achieve this conversion only speculatively and intersubjectively, and there's no point in pretending otherwise. Now, the reason that I wanted um, to use this as kind of a lead off is really if I'm going to be kind of both using the capitalist power approach, but then looking more specifically at the Hollywood film business, I'm going to have to come up with some understanding of if you want to characterize this as a relation, or I mean, however you want to characterize it, but I'm going to have to account for these two concepts. Now, more specifically, and this is kind of why I want to use the workshop format, I want to use uh, this time. Uh, at least in one part of this presentation, to think about what is strategic sabotage. Because it is obviously a concept that has come up over and over throughout the presentation. People have been applying it to their own case studies or uh, aspects um, of, their, of their work. And so I definitely think it's something that I would welcome any opinions about or any sort of interpretations of that concept. Uh, now for me, and this kind of came out of my abstract, for me, these are two questions that I kind of, really, these are the questions that I'm really kind of trying to wrap my head around. So the first one is, how does the power creation relationship of strategic sabotage determine the qualitative dimensions of social creativity? And the second one, if the sabotage of creation is capitalized, how is the exercise of power over the, the creation of social signification capitalized? And by social signification, I'm taking that from Castoriadis, and that can mean all sorts of things um, culture, meaning all sorts of values that are uh, given to the world around us. So to kind of give a brief overview of what I'm going to do today, I'm going to be kind of operating at two registers. So unfortunately, with the time limit, the connection between the registers uh, may not actually um, be that clear. However, if anyone has kind of either questions about the first part of the presentation or the second part, uh, I will welcome both. So in the first, what I would like to do is just kind of give a briefest of overviews of what I'm trying to think of as this power creation relationship in, capital, uh, in capitalism. And in that case, it's looking at the concept of strategic sabotage. If I kind of take those ideas or those questions that I'm thinking about, the next task is to observe, is observing capitalist power. I'm going to offer my present hypothesis, which I have printed out. I'm not going to read the whole thing out, uh, but I'll just highlight some aspects. And the second one is I'm going to workshop a figure, one figure that I'm actually working on right now. Uh, so I'm going to kind of go through it step by step and try to understand if there's a way to actually quantify creativity or kind of like better termed kind of the qualities of film and the future expectations of the Hollywood film business. 
So in absentee ownership, uh, Thorsten Veblen, in many, uh, in many parts of that work, sometimes adds this phrase when he mentions strategic sabotage. He calls it a conscientious withdrawal of efficiency. Um, I'm not really going to go through the entire kind of business industry relationship uh, in Veblen. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. You've, uh, for most of you or all of you that have read Capitalist Power, they do an excellent job going through that. The important part, though, is obviously that there is a separation between the institutions of business and industry. So in this case, business stands outside of industry. So as, as it is described, business is the power of private ownership over industry, the modern means of social reordering and reorganization. Again, I'm not going to go into Veblen's concept of capital. But in this case, the owner derives an income from his or her legal rights to sabotage industry, to, quote, keep the work out of the hands of the workmen and the product out of the market. If I could give kind of the most general characterization of strategic sabotage, you can kind of then give it this description, that capitalist power, in some aspect of it, or maybe the central aspect of it, is that there's a determin determinate negation of industry. Uh, from the perspective of social creation, this form of negation is heteronymous. Now, the reason that I wanted to workshop this rather than present it as an argument is that obviously there are things that we need to think about using this, when using this concept. I don't think this concept is, you know, it's not merely just for the means of interpreting Veblen, but if we are going to be doing research utilizing this concept, we need to kind of understand certain aspects of it. So here are some things that I've just been thinking about, and if anyone has any opinions in the question period, I would definitely welcome it. So the first one would be that, and this kind of comes up in both uh, Veblen and uh, in Jonathan and Shimshon's work, is that sabotage is not always, let's call it, expressed, is not always utilized to the letter. In many cases, there are threats of sabotage. So this is a, a quotation from Jonathan, an earlier paper of Jonathan and Shimshon. What matters is the right to exclude and the ability to exact terms for not exercising that right. The next aspect is that industry is limited, but not completely suffocated. So from the perspectives of business, there can be such thing as too much sabotage. So while it's very easy in a very general sense to want to use those terms and say, OK, business stands over industry, and you want to maybe kind of use that as, OK, that's a way to kind of critique power, it's not something that you can always throw around in kind of the ways that you want it to, because in this case, too much sabotage can be just as bad as too little. Uh, now, the third aspect is something that I'm kind of thinking, uh, thinking through more in this, so this is something that uh, I would welcome any comments about, is that the withdrawal of industrial cap capacity is not simply a, redu a reduction of quantitative output. So it's not really that you need to kind of put strategic sabotage as almost kind of a production function and say that, you know, rather than making 1,000 cars, they only make 700. You could say that, yes, that could be an example of sabotage, but what about the qualitative dimensions of social creativity, where business actually then uses their rights of ownership to actually exact terms over certain qualitative dimensions, such as design or aesthetic dimensions of what they control? So in relation to that, it's then kind of a task for me to observe this or attempt to observe this. And this is, uh, I guess, kind of let's call it a hunch or something that when I guess this kind of combines a bunch of my theoretical interests but when we're reading a bunch of people uh, I kind of bring all these ideas together and I kind of have this hunch in my head and I say strategic sabotage can affect alter and even repress social signification through the negation of industry's potential so there's a lot there and really on its own it's not really an answer it's actually more kind of an indication that actually I need to be doing more work. Because while I kind of feel that is a kind of a good theoretical method of actually uh, kind of explaining the world, clearly I need to actually kind of uh, follow along with Troy, kind of explain how these things maybe actually come about either in a sector or how a story can be told um, with these concepts. Because as I completely agree, um, from not only his presentation but a few others, some of these terms as kind of these big abstract universals they don't really help that much. So I did print out 
an initial hypothesis. So some of you may have already read it, uh, but I will read only certain parts of it. So the first thing that I'm kind of thinking about is that just as past institutions persisted on account of their ability to repress historical alternatives, Hollywood firms use the capitalist mode of power, their ability to sabotage industry and their rights of ownership to attempt to harden the magma of significations, which is a term I'm taking from Castoriadis, that is relevant to investment in mass culture. Strategic sabotage is used to predetermine, as best as possible, the place of new creation in an instituted field of social significations. If I'm kind of following along with that idea, importantly, the autonomous creation of new social significations is a threat to capitalist interests. The third one is that since capitalization is forward-looking, the calculated expectations of the Hollywood film business concern the future of mass culture. These firms discount expected future earnings to present prices according to their perception of the social historical state of pleasure. Now, what I want to do today, and this is now what I'm going to be workshopping the figure, which is included in the handout, so feel free to already look at it. I will bring it up. Um, I will bring it up onto the screen later, but what I would like to do is go through step by step of explaining my attempt to maybe getting at this and whether it kind of uh, stands strong or falls flat on its face, that's up to you, but it's an attempt for me to actually work through some of this. So going through the third part of my initial hypothesis, there seems to be an aspect where I need to kind of account for this expectations about the future qualities of cinema. Now, the reason that I actually uh, worked on this figure is because, and I'm going to kind of almost in a sense present it as a story, because there is kind of a, a general problem. <coughs> there is a general problem within kind of the study, or let's call it the political, the economic, the political economic study of mass culture. And to kind of paraphrase uh, the novelist Michel Welbeck, is that past qualities of cinema and the general state of mass culture appear to be predetermined. So what tends to happen is that when someone says, OK, I'm going to do this uh, absolutely amazing political, economic, uh, critical theory study of Hollywood, and I'm going to look at both the financial aspects, the cultural aspects, and the political aspects, in many cases, it's always looking backwards. And I'll give an example. So sticking with 1986, and this is now me kind of explaining how I'm actually going to go through making this figure. I'll give an example. So let's say you want to do the political economy of Hollywood cinema in the 1980s. So you go to a website like Box Office Mojo, and you say, OK, I'm going to look at 1986. What you get here are, this is ranked according to box office gross revenues. And you say, OK, let's go through some of these movies. Top Gun, Platoon, Aliens, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Most of you have either seen those movies, or at least you know about them. But here's the problem for doing an analysis of this. What tends to happen is that everything seems to be in its right place. So you do an analysis of 1986, and you say to yourself, Top Gun. Well, of course Top Gun's the number one movie in 1986, because it has Tom Cruise, it has the American military, it has all sorts of things. But in my opinion, that's looking at 1986 from any time after 1986, from 2012 or 1987. So when you're looking backwards, it seems that these movies, their value or whatever you want to call it, it, it all makes sense. So what I'm kind of doing in this, and I'll kind of explain uh, a bit more of how I actually came to uh, making this figure, is I asked myself, what would 1986 look like from 1985 or from 1984 or from 1983? So you have a table of scripts. You're developing projects. So someone comes up to you and says, I have this idea for a movie. I would like to do it. How, what's the budget? What are the potential returns on this movie? So how could you find a way? And again, this is a proxy. I don't want to say this is actually you know, the exact measure of how they do it. Uh, but how would you find a proxy to get an indication of what 1986 looks like from 1985 or 84 or 83? Because if a project is greenlit in 1983, if they say Top Gun in 1983, let's give it the go, let's make this movie, they're already thinking through 
possibly what are its potential earnings and what is the future success of this movie. So what I did was is that on the, on all of the, uh, on the website of Box Office Mojo is that now look at this column. Oh, sorry, the mouse is moving. Um, in this column, what you have is the number of opening theaters. So what you see is, is that obviously in some of these movies, they actually have a different amount of theaters that were opened in. So for instance, Platoon only opened in six, and Top Gun opened in 1,028. So I use opening theaters as a proxy as an expectation of future earnings. The reason that I do that is because the number of opening theaters, this is the first day that a movie opens, that decision is made, it precedes this. This is obviously the total yearly earnings of those movies. Their decision of how many theaters to have it open in is something that actually happens before that. Now, to follow through with that hunch, if you actually sort the table in another way, you get a different result. So we all recognize this, we all recognize this, we recognize these movies. And we say, of course, these are the top 10 movies in 1986. If you sort 1986 by the number of opening theaters, you actually get a different result. You get, actually in a funny way, some movies that you've probably never heard of, like Cobra, The Delta Force, Raw Deal, Howard the Duck. So in this case, what you actually have is a kind of a glimpse of maybe what they were thinking would be the biggest box office gross movies of 1986. So now to kind of go about explaining this figure. So what I did was, was I did the top 10%, so not the top 10, I should make that absolutely clear. The top 10%, I counted the top 10% movies, and then I did two things. The top line, is pretty much that first table, the one with Top Gun on it, Crocodile Dundee, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I did the total gross revenues of the top 10% as a share of all revenues for that year. So actually, in a funny way, that line is interesting on its own, because as you can see, in about the 80s, the top 10% movies were actually only pulling in about 50, 60%, but by the time we get to the knots and after 2010, the top 10% is actually pulling in over 70% of all box office gross revenues in the United States. The second line is what I did with the second table. So again, it's not the top 10, the top 10%. I added up their revenues. It's, yes, it is revenues, but it's sorted by opening theaters. And I did it again as shares of the yearly total of all films. So as you can see, they actually start to narrow. So if you actually create a ratio, which I did on the bottom, which is on the right-hand side of the axis, you can actually see the ratio between the two. So what you see is in the 80s, that difference is actually quite stark. And not only that, it fluctuates quite a bit. So going back to my two tables, that first table had movies that you recognized. On that second table, it had movies that you had, you've probably never heard of, or maybe you've heard of, but you've never seen. Over time, it actually not only lessens in its kind of rate of change, but it gets closer and closer to one. So what does it mean when it gets closer and closer to one? What that means is, in both of these series, the same movies are in both series. So let me give an example. So I did 1986. So we now pull up 2007. So 2007, if you actually look on the figure, that's one of the years where this ratio is actually very close to one. Again, I'm not doing the top 10% because that would be many, many movies, so I just did the top 10. But in this case, you more or less get a different picture than you did from 1986. If you rank that table by gross revenues, you get movies that we all recognize, more or less. But funny enough, ranked by opening theaters, you actually get many of the same movies. Even more interesting is that the top five movies are in both tables. They're in different orders, but Pirates of the Caribbean, Harry Potter, Spider-Man 3, Shrek, and Transformers are both in the top five of both series. 
So if I'm going to make a kind of general guess, thank you, uh, if I'm going to make a bit of a general guess about that, when they're calculating the expected future earnings of something like Pirates of the Caribbean, I'm making a guess here, but it seems that they're pretty confident of knowing that it would be somewhere in the top five, maybe somewhere in the top 10, but they're not going to think Pirates of the Caribbean is going to be an absolute failure. So this is, I guess, as a by way of a conclusion, I kind of went through two aspects of my presentation, uh, two aspects of my project. One a bit more general, one a bit more specific with one figure. But really, what I'm trying to do is to try to understand this relationship. Relationship of the creativity on one film in relation to the magma of significations, this kind of general kind of uh, this ocean of meaning that is constantly changing. Because what I'm trying to think through is I'm trying to make the argument that strategic sabotage is not necessarily just on a movie. That it could actually be strategic sabotage has something to do with this relationship. So I don't want to say that strategic sabotage doesn't happen specifically with the making of one movie. So if, for instance, Lillian Ross wrote this excellent journalistic piece about this about this movie, The Red Badge of Courage, where pretty much it's a business versus industry story, where the director, John Huston, more or less has his movie taken away from him, and management spends the rest of the time pretty much making this movie worse by editing it to death. Including in that was the business decision to actually have this, not only at the top of the poster, but at the start of the movie, where the start of the movie, it shows someone opening a book telling the viewer that you're about to watch a movie that was once ad adapted by a book. Uh, sorry, once was a book, a famous one by Stephen Crane. But what I'm trying to think through a bit more is this relationship, how there can be not only a sabotage of a particular movie or particular movies that they own, but in relation to a general field of meaning. I, I guess that's really it. I could take questions and comments about really either aspects of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, James, for a very interesting presentation. I didn't see the order. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, as many other presentations, this was brilliant, I think. Uh, I, I have uh, a comment uh, quite different than the ones that I made earlier, and my comment is uh, you should get just this thing, just this story, published as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, before and after you do it, make sure that somewhere in these charts you uh, kind of uh, create some, some form of identification of who generated th this chart, because the sharks are out there. The, you need to put some elementary form of sabotage on what you do to make sure that this is not going to I immediately be uh, confiscated by somebody else. It's brilliant. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to laud you on, laud you on the, the, the brilliance of this. I, I think your insights on um, expectation and how we kind of can understand the quantitative and qualitative aspects of expectation are incredible and I also encourage you to get this published because I want to make use of some of those insights in my, oh, my well, own work. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the, the, one, the one suggestion I, I also wanted to make was to, to not simply focus on kind of this realm of, of signification uh, in the way that, that Castoriadis at, at times does and which I somewhat criticized in, because he, he conceives of, of the nomos as leaning up against the physis. But I think there are important physical components to this. For example, how uh, amalgamation of distribution and, and theaters and the failure of small theaters just simply eliminated the, the diversity that's available to a, a viewing public to make choices against what the, the major um, movie makers want them to make. So that, that's a, a very physical, concrete, sometimes mm. literally, aspect of this. Uh, I guess I would like to actually take kind of questions one at a time. So I, I completely agree. Um, and I guess I sh maybe should have made it a bit more clear that I was trying to isolate that particular problem. Because uh, for sure, there are many ways that 
sabotage could actually happen within the film business, even the physical limitation of how you can see a movie, or sometimes the physical ease of how you can see a movie can change these things. So piracy and all sorts of things are, these are other aspects of this project that I would definitely need to account for. Um, yeah, because I guess for me, the, the aspect of the, the creative aspect it is a real pickle for me, because it's trying to think through of how someone would actually quantify meaning, how someone would actually look at a script or look at an idea as property and say, that movie, based on its content, could generate me these earnings, based on what the, what the people look like in the film, the story, that, that's really what they're doing during development, right? The film's not yet made, and they're trying to actually account for, can these qualities actually generate me money? And how does that, I don't know how, exactly how it happens, but. Can I just offer sure. one kind of Oh. Sorry. So if, if we're thinking about kind of a, a material and an immaterial component to this, this closing, like the closing of the gap between these two, I'm wondering if, if looking at um, home video rentals might help distinguish which were the major components. Where with the home video rentals, that that diversity is 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 more available and not as restricted by what's going on in the realm of distribution, amalgamation, and closing theaters and 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 things like that. Where kind of the psyche of the public is more able to express itself and. If it too is closing to the same degree, then maybe the major effect is their ability to kind of alter the minds of the public to accept their dominant offerings. Right. Oh, thank you. I I really like the presentation as well. Thank you. And uh, basically, as I see it, you really um, have taken the theory of the culture industry uh, a major step forward. Uh, one question I have is whether you think that you could do the same thing for, uh, say, the publishing of novels or other art forms. And kind of as a, of a more uh, cheeky remark, is this presentation about the lowest common denominator? And, also, and to add to that, can you identify the most average film I guess in response to that is that um, I, I, I'm tempted to say that, but it seems that if you actually even look at the future expectations of 1986, some of these movies sound terrible, right? Some of these movies seem to also be appealing to, if you want to call it the lowest common denominator. But when you get to 2007, and I mean, many people have written on this part, on the qualitative aspect of this, adaptations of books, adaptations of things that there's a, maybe a greater degree of confidence because they know people are consuming these. So if you go to 2007, I mean, I, this is a story you've probably heard a million times, is that many of the firms in the Hollywood film business are buying up properties, right? And they're doing, intelli uh, sorry, intellectual properties to then turn into movies. Including that, Disney owns Marvel. So when Marvel movies are made, that's Disney. They have the rights to all of those characters now. So. Uh, I, I see the point, but I, I think that there is a bit of a, a qualitative shift that has maybe something to do with where they're getting the lowest common denominator from, right? There, they may, there may be a, bit, a greater degree of confidence that I need to account for. Yeah, I thought uh, it's a really great presentation, but uh, there's a couple of, one point I'd like to make you. I mean, you are, this is about mass culture. And I think you have to make that very clear because, I mean, this is something which is, we've been going around this, this um, conference uh, talking about publishing and so on and so forth because the, the possibilities of autonomous creation, uh, which may not be subject to, sub, uh, to uh, a strategic sabotage, is on the net. Uh, and this is, of course, where the creativity is escaping. And it seems to me that dominant capital has two choices. Uh, uh, one is that uh, there'll be a total bifurcation, and this will apply only to mass culture. I've not 
although I'm a great consumer of films, I've not seen any of them because I'm not part of the mass. <laughs> and, uh, and, or alternatively control the web, right? And that's what I think when we talk about publication, this is the moment because we're at the, the turning point over the possibility of controlling the creativity, the creativity of publishing uh, and, and of movies and anything on the web. And the, that's the only thing, my comment will be, you make it clear that this is, you're talking about mass culture and that the other forms of creativity have escaped in the, in the, in the last couple of decades. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I absolutely um, would agree with that point. Um, I guess the other thing that I should have mentioned in the presentation is that last year I kind of did a presentation just kind of building sort of the, the building blocks of my project. Uh, where I'm trying to get data on both revenues and operational income of some of these um, segments of these what are now giant conglomerates. I still haven't yet even pieced together that the kind of the connection between the two, the connection between this and some of the other work that I've done. Um, because it seems that the internet and the rise of piracy or the kind of alternative means have kind of proliferated and th that has both a, a very strong kind of qualitative story to it, but there may be some quantitative dimensions that I would need to explore with that. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, thanks, uh, James, great presentation. That was really clever, really neat, uh, what you did here. I'm just wondering, first of all, presumably you don't know why this is happening, how they're doing this, but are there any other trends that you can maybe tell us about? Perhaps uh, fewer companies out there, therefore more, uh, I don't know if I should call it collusion, but less competition perhaps, or maybe fewer movies are coming out, so it's becoming easier to predict. And I also want to point out that, just glancing at that, you notice that pretty much every single one of those movies is some sort of a sequel or adaptation of something else. So it's already like a big thing, and they're just repackaging it over and over again. Whereas, you go back to the other graph, you see, I don't know if they're orig original, but you know more creative things that are a lot more volatile, a lot more dangerous. Whereas here, you go, okay, Spider-Man 3, Shrek the third, I mean, half of them are sequels, the other half are probably books or comic books or something like that. Right. So perhaps you can comment on that, thanks. Um, with respect to uh, the ownership structure, uh, most of the kind of acquisitions of film studios happened more or less in the 80s, but about in the late 80s. So, I mean, you could, you could make some sort of argument here, kind of a very kind of rudimentary kind of separation between 1990 and before. And you can say that there obviously is maybe a, sh a change in the rate of change of this ratio. Uh, but it would be something that I would have to investigate. Uh, with respect to the, con the content um, that is actually being produced, uh, yeah, it's, some of that is just, I mean, I agree. It's clear as day that they're resorting to uh, clearly sequels and just repackaging. And now we're in the, we're in the world of reboots where they're not even doing sequels. They're just telling the same story again and again. And they've just made a total recall. They're going to make every movie that you've already seen, they'll make a new one probably next year. So uh, yeah. uh, yes, this is a response to the issue that you raised regarding uh, the question of how actually predictions are made. And p perhaps it's worthwhile mentioning uh, a book that was written by Michael Lewis. I think it's called Moneyball. And they, they actually made a movie out of it with, uh, I think it was Brad Pitt. Uh, anyways, it's a story of how baseball was uh, subjected to the production function. Because essentially, baseball was, was uh, uh, organized uh, as, uh, as a collective enterprise. So you would build a team, an entire team. And uh, it was changed by trying to figure out whether we can put a price on each uh, player and also characterize the um, sort of uh, physical or play uh, qualities of that player and quantify them. So uh, you will have a production function that basically tells you what are the inputs in terms of the qualities of the player quantified and what should be the market value of that player based on the different attributes. And then you compare what you get from that computation to the actual market price. So you would start buying actors whose actual price is lower than their fair value 
based on that production function idea. Uh, so essentially, you, you quantify that qualitative uh, process in that way, and uh, it turned out to be uh, quite successful in terms of uh, uh, getting most out of those underpriced assets. And it, this method was adopted uh, in baseball. And I don't think it's the same thing in movies because it will be quite more difficult to uh, find out the specific attributes of the movie. But I, I would not be surprised that something similar is boiling under the surface. So that might be uh, sort of a, uh, a tentative hypothesis with which you can uh, work with or, or try to explore. Yeah, with, uh, in relation to that, uh, going through the annual report of Time Warner, when they actually amortize their uh, film libraries, they say, we don't do straight line amortization. We do what is called film forecast methodology, where it seems that they're trying to do exactly that. And, and I looked into it briefly on some of the accounting firms. There's like people that offer these services. And they seem to be absolutely insane with how they can actually quantify almost every aspect of a film. The facial structure of the actor in relation to previous actors. So if actor in 2010 kind of reminds you of Cary Grant, they say, OK, well, actually, this may have more value because kind of the, the looks of the characters may be kind of consistent or similar. I haven't yet investigated more about whether they also are looking into something like fair value, but the, the suggestion definitely helps. Thanks. Do you think the move to one is an indication of, of uh, over sabotage, Sorry, of desperation? The move to? It's the move that you, <laughs> it's the move that you gave towards one, <sighs> an indication of over sabotage, of defeat and desperation, in as mm. much as that. Right. Um, because in your 8086 model, Clearly, there were a lot of films that made enormous amounts of money which they didn't expect. And uh, now, they've got a greater predictability, but uh, possibly... Well, the thing is that if, if I was maybe an artist, I would hate it. Um, but it seems that kind of going back to the previous presentation on kind of risk in insurance, if this was completely determinable, they would, they would love it. They would, they would absolutely love it if this kind of, like, risk was not either a problem or a blip on the map. Um, I, I don't see why going, like, I mean, as, as a film fan, I mean, and this is what I really do take also from the capitalist power approach, because most cultural theory or critical theory of mass culture in Hollywood takes the bottom-up perspective. It takes, I'm a lover of the arts, I'm a lover of movies, I'm a lover of aesthetics, Mass culture is often crappy. It's not very good, or it does all these bad things. But from a top-down perspective, you want the opposite. Maybe you don't want mass culture in the exact way, but you want some sort of confidence in what you're actually developing, what you're selling. Um, and that requires a different logic. I'm trying to get maybe a sense of what that logic would be. I may be a bit off on some of the fuzzy points, but. I'm doing my best not to look at mass culture from the bottom up and say, these movies are bad for x, y, and z reasons. Um, uh, no, no, yeah, sorry, yeah. Well. Uh, you, you, you pointed out uh, the, the top line, the top 10 sorted by gross revenues and how it's flattening off and now kind of starting to decline. I'm wondering if that could be interpreted as kind of now a rebellion against this process that people have finally had enough of sort of being shaped to the degree that they're seemingly being yeah, shaped. Oh, right. Oh. It, and and it, this is also could be considered, you know, the, the, the movement towards one could also be considered something of an envelope that they're, that they're encountering. And, and I'm wondering what break, I mean, they obviously can't go lower than one, but what breaking through that, that envelope kind of might conceptually require. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I really, I really don't know, but it would be something very interesting because I, it is something that I'm, I, you do get, I do get, I, I was getting a bit of a hunch when I was kind of working through that, that there may be a problem like that because I mean, how far can this go? It can't, can it, can, can it get to the point where it does actually hit one? You know, I mean, that's, I, I have no idea, so. No. Um, yes, um, very interesting project and very interesting ideas, but um, I, 
I wonder a bit uh, if some of the concepts uh, you try to use are um, a bit too big. Uh, perhaps you have to, to mediate uh, things a bit. Uh, I mean, uh, you speak of the specter of radical creation. Um, by the way, creation is radical or it is not creation. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. um, this, this is, all, this is uh, uh, the culture industries. This is mass uh, culture and it's manufactured since long time, manufactured uh, creativity. Um, so uh, creation would, in, 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 a, yes, in this radical sense, would mean, yes, a, a new art form, perhaps, or something like, like that. And um, so, yes, there, there, there have to be uh, uh, mediations Oh, I, I w would agree with that in the sense that if I am kind of taking terms from Castoriadis, the kind of autonomous aspect or his definition of creation can be, it can be very, very, it can be a monumental shift. It can be very great in its scope of what he means by the creation of something new. I think what I was thinking through when using those concepts is that, uh, and this would be maybe, I would have to exp do a bit more work kind of similar to something like Lully and Ross, we're looking at maybe the structure of how movies are made. Because when I use the word creation, I don't want to make it, there is a possibility of an alternative art form, but there is also the possibility of deviating from the expectations of business when making a movie. So movies have budgets, they have time schedules, and I mean there are some famous examples of really the what is quote unquote called the artistic side deviating from that in ways that man makes management go crazy. Um, so uh, Stephen Bach, the vice president of United Artists, when they made, for some of you may recognize this film, you probably haven't seen it, but there was a movie called Heaven's Gate in 1980, and it gets constantly uh, told, uh, it's constantly mentioned as the uh, biggest financial failure um, from the perspectives of business. So, hmm? Yeah, but it was a failure because Michael. J it was, be but it was a failure from the eyes of business because the executive producer was actually Michael Cimino's. So the director of the film, Michael Cimino, the executive producer was his friend, and she did not do any of the things that an executive producer is supposed to do. She didn't keep it on budget. She did. He just said, "I'm doing whatever I want. I'm making a beautiful movie. In a sense, leave me alone." He, law he tried to exclude management from the set. He tried to constantly not allow people to tell him how the movie would be made. So one of the things that happened was, in one of the days, he sat around all day, paid everyone. These are, these are unionized employees, paid everyone, sat around all day just filming the horizon. Just let's get some shots of the horizon. The sun would go up and down, right? And he would be like, okay, hey, let's film this, let's film it again. The conclusion of the book from the vice president is that business needs to come back into this, right? Business needs to kind of reclamp, because this guy subsequently was fired from United Artists. Many people lost their jobs for this. But his argument was creation, and I know I'm not using it in the exact sense of uh, Castoriadis in this sense, it needs to walk a line. And it needs to walk a line prescribed by business. It can maybe deviate a bit. Yes, you can have creative people, uh, but it can't go so far left or so far right that it it ruins our, in a sense, our expectations of the movie. Unfortunately, we're out of time for questions, but thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you.